Leprechaun in Spanish. Interesting. Alright, let's drop the music a little bit. A little loud in my head. What is this download? Uh, wow, oh, they got a whole bunch of interesting things. Alright, you know what we're going to do? We're going to zoom in a bit so we can, uh, y'all have a chance to at least see what I'm seeing. Okay. Is that... Garcia Lorca was a Spanish artist, pretty mad, friends with Dali, if I'm not mistaken, lots of amazing artistic stuff. You know, if you had asked me if he was like an artist, I might have said yeah, but um, I couldn't have told you why. Writer, okay. Well, there's some are more than others, you know, Malator. Some some of them are a little nutty, and some of them are very nutty. So it's a relative term. <coughs> Anywho, <laughs> yeah, that. Well, that if you're working with Dali, it's got to be a you got to be uh, willing to go out there a little bit because that stuff was radical. Anywho, so I'm gonna read this. Feel free to comment on my comments, or if you think I've got something wrong. It's awesome. Just let me know. Ladies and gentlemen, between 1918 and when I entered the Residencia de Estudiantes in Madrid and 1928 when I left, so the dude was in like school for a decade here, that's interesting, having completed my study of philosophy and letters, I listened to around a thousand lectures in, the, in that elegant salon where the old Spanish aristocracy went to do penance for triviality, for frivolity on French beaches. You know, the history of the university, a lot of these history uh, universities started actually as a way for rich people to pay off clergy to say prayers for them so that they were basically paying off um, their sins. This is what it was like back in the day. If you were rich and you needed to pray for your sins, you could just pay some like uh, poor um, religious person to pray for you. Like you could have them pray as a proxy to God for you and that's actually how a, lot, how a lot of old universities were started there were prayer circles that rich people sponsored to do like you know what the priesthood wanted which was to teach people uh, priestly things and make prayers and so they actually um, that's how universities used to start was rich like aristocracy doing penance for his trivialities is um that's exactly what this is so this is actually it starts off as a kind of a snide historical point i agree with uh, that the catholic church has definitely like worked towards the evolution of universities and you know i'm in new york there's fordham university here which is a, Jesu a jesuit university the jesuits are a catholic order and um they basically like their whole thing is education so the catholic church has been you know like jesuit university is a thing okay longing for air and sunlight i was so bored i used to feel as though i was covered in fine ash on the point of changing into peppery sneezes yeah so no i don't want that terrible terrible blow fly of boredom to enter this room threading all your heads together on the slender necklace of sleep and setting a tiny cluster of sharp needles in your listen in your my listener's eyes in a simple way in the register that in my poetic voice holds neither the gleams of wood nor the angles of hemlock nor those sheep that suddenly become knives of irony i want to see if i can give you a simple lesson on the buried spirit of saddened spain all right so this is already way better written than like 99% of all the philosophy I've ever read. I mean, you can just see here this like the in the in a simple way, comma, in the register that in the register that, comma, in my poetic voice. This person has a sense of pacing that you do not see in philosophy nearly ever. This person already knows how to break up a sentence to, you know, set you up cuz uh, one like four words, small words, like five words, no, there's also four words, four words and then a, a slightly longer one holds neither the gleam of wood, gleams of wood, nor the angles of a hemlock. So these are bigger words. Already, this person has 
set you up in a certain way. Yeah. Well, it's fine. Just because this person at least knows what they're doing, Infernal. As opposed to a lot of the philosophers. Um, because the philosophers have no idea what they're doing. They're just writing for a different purpose. So. <laughs> Anyhow. Whoever travels the bull's hide that stretches between the Hook Hukar, Guadalfeo, Guadalfeo, Seal, and Pisuerga rivers, not to mention the tributaries that meet those waves, the color of a lion's mane that stir the plata, frequently hears people say, This has much duende. Manuel Torre, great artist from the Andalusian people, said to someone who sang for him, You have a voice, you understand style, but you'll never ever succeed because you have no duende. All throughout, all through Andalusia, from the Rock of Jaén to the snail's shell of Cadiz, people constantly talk about the duende and recognize it wherever it appears with a fine instinct. That wonderful singer El Lebrijano, creator of the Debla, said, On days when I sing with duende, no one can touch me. The old gypsy dancer La Malena once heard Bre Brelowski play a fragment of Bach and exclaimed, Ole, that has duende but was bored by Gluck, Brahms, and Milhaud. And Manuel Torre, a man who had more culture in his veins than anyone I've, I've known, on hearing Fala play his own Nocturno del Generalife, spoke this splendid sense. All that has dark sound has duende. And there's no deeper truth than that. All right, so we're going to find out what this duende is, I hope. Those dark sounds are the mystery, the roots that cling to the mire that we all know, that we all ignore, but from which comes the very substance of art. Dark sounds, said the man of the Spanish people, agreeing with Goethe, who in speaking of P Paganini, hit on a definition of the duende, a mysterious force that everyone feels and no philosopher has explained. Interesting. I just found out today that uh, Goethe's last words were more light more light which was really interesting i was watching a stream uh this morning um uh an artist he's a um watercolor artist from germany um is absinthe i don't know if i'll spell his name right if i typed in chat now but absinthe was saying you know i'm always thinking like i get, like my vision gets a little darker i think i'm gonna die because of Goethe's last words so <laughs> i was like <laughs> it's a little dramatic but um yeah it's, it's interesting more light is was Goethe's last words so we're talking about dark sounds here and so they're worried about the darkness and like the coming death so then the duende is a force not a labor a struggle not a thought I heard an old maestro of the guitar say the duende is not in the throat the duende surges up inside from the soles of the feet meaning it's not a question of skill but of a style that's truly alive Meaning in its veins, meaning it's of the most ancient culture of in immediate creation. Okay, so now we're well, meaning, I think, in this sense, and there's a lot of definitions of meaning uh, in philosophy, of course, but meaning in the sense that you're connecting to something outside of yourself. You're connecting to something in the world. That's what's from the soles of the feet. You're connecting to the, the earth below you. It surges up like, uh, like you know, water uh, getting coming up in a, a geyser or something it's coming up from the ground up from the water it's like rising up like a well so we're talking about where's the power coming from it's coming from an external nature uh, of some sort and that's what it is ancient culture of immediate creation so it's like a well like water a spring just coming out of nature so in that that's the sense of meaning is that you're connecting to like one of these well springs this mysterious force that everyone feels and no philosopher has explained is, in some, the spirit of the earth, the same duende that scorched Nietzsche's heart as he searched for its out outer form on the Rialto Bridge and in Bizet's music without finding it, and without seeing that the duende he pursued had leapt from the Greek mysteries to the dancers of Cadiz and the headless Dionysiac scream of Silverio's Siguria. I apologize how I say my Spanish. My Spanish is poor. So then, I don't want anyone to confuse the duende with the theological demon of doubt at whom Luther, with Bacchic feeling, hurled a pot of ink at Isaac Eisenach, nor the Catholic devil, destructive and of low intelligence, who disguised himself as a bitch to enter coven, covens, 
convents, <laughs> nor the talking monkey carried by Cervantes Malgizi in his comedy of jealousies in the Andalusian woods. No, the duende I mean, secret and shuddering, is descended from that blithe daemon. See, this is a different spelling of daemon. D-A-E-M-O-N. That's a little different. Yeah, and it's what talked... So, okay, here's a history. Let me finish up this sentence and I'll, t I'll, t I'll get you a little history. Is descended from that blithe daemon, all marble and salt, of Socrates, whom it scratched at indignantly on the day when he drank the hemlock, and that other me melancholy demon of Descartes, diminutive as a green almond, that, tired of lines and circles, fled along the canals to listen to the singing of drunken sailors. Okay, so this daemon here, D-A-E-M-O-N, Socrates said that he actually had a voice in his head. That was he, he. He heard voices, and it was the voices, in some sense, that asked him questions and made him do things. And he called it his daemon, and that, of this spelling, D A E M O N, which you can see is different from the D E M O N of Descartes. So that's a little history there. So there's something that was talking to Socrates that was outside of himself. He felt. And the other melancholy demon of Descartes, but this is an evil demon. But he's so, he, he of course, Descartes' demon hides. It, it hides the world. So he's tired of whatever, he's so small, he's like a green almond, whatever that is, I'm not sure. But he's like that of tired of lines and circles, fled along the canals, listening to the singing of drunken sailors. So that demon of Descartes has recreated the whole world, a world of, uh, you know, a fake world. But so, but what's interesting here is, um, the author is saying um, basically that the demon wanted this. They wanted to go hang out with the, the sailors because they made this world, the world of illusion. They made the world of illusion. That's where they wanted to be. For every man, every artist called Nietzsche or Cezanne, every step that he climbs in the tower of his perfection is at the expense of the struggle that he undergoes with his duende, not with an angel as his soft as is often said, nor with his muse. This is a precise and fundamental distinction at the root of their work. So, this is a, so all the work that people like Nietzsche and Cezanne are doing are pulling themselves away from the duende. It's interesting. We still like because Nietzsche likes, you know, I don't know as much about Cezanne, but Nietzsche, on the other hand. Nietzsche was always trying to, you know, overcome. You want to be a better human. Like, what is it to, like, you know, have an artistic life? Like, to have an art and a life that's interesting and good and, like, uh, different from other people. And so that's, like, this dream of, like, becoming something bigger than yourself. But that is also inherently getting away from the world. And I think that's exactly what's getting pointed on here um, that Lorca is hitting is that is it Garcia Lorca, I guess? Yeah, Garcia Lorca is hitting is that if you are working only on yourself, you are somehow out, you're not engaging with the world. And I think that's what they're hitting on with Nietzsche. And then the Cezanne, of course, was the modernist painters. Um, that was, you know, again, a psychological thing. And so it's getting away from the world. But I don't remember my Cezanne well enough to really speak on that. The angel guides and grants like, like St. Raphael, defends and spares like St. Michael, proclaims and forewarns like St. Gabriel. The angel dazzles but flies over a man's head, high above, shedding its grace, and the man realizes his work or his charm or his dance effortlessly. The angel on the road to Damascus and that which entered through the cracks in the little balcony at Assisi or the one that followed him in Heinrich Suso's footsteps create order and there is no way to oppose their light since they beat their wings of steel in an atmosphere of predestination. The muse dictates and occasionally prompts. She can do relatively little since she's distant and so tired, I've seen her twice, that you think her heart half marble. Muse poets hear voices and don't know where they're from, but they're from the muse who inspires them and sometimes makes her meal of them, as in the case of Apollinaire, a great poet destroyed by the great by the terrifying muse next to whom the divine angelic Rousseau once painted him. Okay, so these are again things that are pulling you away from the earth. The muse pulls 
you're you went to her this is more like a succubus to me it sounds like and the angel the gods they pull you out they're going over your man's head high above even though you get a perfection out of them it's still um the opposite direction coming up from down from the sky not up from the earth the muse stirs the intellect, bringing a landscape of columns and illusory taste of laurel, and intellect is often poetry's enemy, since it limits too much, since it lifts the poet into the bondage of aristocratic fineness, where he forgets that he might be eaten suddenly by ants, or, by, or that a huge arsenical arson, arson lobster might fall on his head. Things against which the muses who inhabit monocles, or the rows of luke, lukewarm lacquer in a tiny salon, have no power. Yeah. Again, it's pulling you away from the earth. Something weird could happen, but the muse, that's not at all the muse. Angel and muse come from the outside, from outside us. The angel brings light, the muse form, he's yet learned from her. Golden bread or fold of tunic, it is her norm that the poet receives in his laurel grove, while the duende has to be rousted from the furthest habitation of the blood. Okay, so again, it, this is coming from, from out. The duende has to be like in your... It's not in your soul. It's in your blood. It's in what the the matter that makes you up. Reject the angel and give the muse a kick. And forget our fear of the scent of violets that 18th century poetry breathes out. And of the great telescope in whose lenses the muse, made ill by the limitation, sleeps. The true struggle is with the duende. So you said this is like the leprechaun. Hmm, interesting. And Fernal says, the person becomes dependent on the will of the external sources, the muse's action. I think that's exactly right. You're getting pulled out away from the world. You're getting, you know, suckered in. It's like a drug. I think that's uh, right. Yeah. The roads where one searches for God are known, whether by the barbaric way of the hermit or the subtle one of the mystic. Just a translation of the word, not the actual same figure. Okay, I understand. I, it didn't sound like we were talking about, like, the, like, Irish leprechaun. <coughs> but it, it, there, there, there's something to that. It's still some sort of mystical uh, agent within nature. Okay. The roads where one searches for God are known, whether by the barbaric way of the hermit or the subtle one of the, mis of the mystic, with the tower like St. Teresa or by the three paths of St. John of the Cross. And though we may have to cry... At, to cry out in Isaiah's voice, truly you are a hidden God. Finally, in the end, God sends his primal thorns of fire to those who seek him. Seeking the duende, there is neither map nor discipline. We only know it burns the blood like powdered glass, that it exhausts, rejects all the sweet geometry we understand, that it shatters styles and makes Goya, master of the grays, silvers, and pinks of the finest English art, paint with his knees and fists in terrible bitumen blacks, or strips moss and cinto for de Gaur, stark naked in the cold of the Pyrenees, or sends Jorge Manrique to wait for death in the waves of Ocaña, or clothes Rimbaud's delicate body in a salting banque costume, or gives the Comte de la Tremont, the eyes of a dead fish at dawn on the boulevard. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's, it, this is making the great the fool at the moment. So this is the, hum, the great humbling uh, factor. The great artists of the southern Spain, gypsy or flamenco, singers, dancers, musician, know that emotion is impossible without the arrival of the duende. They might deceive people into thinking they can communicate the sense of duende without possessing it, as authors, painters, and literary fashion makers deceive us every day without possessing duende. But we only have to attend little and not be full of indifference to discover the fraud and chase off that clumsy artifice. I mean, that's fair. There are things... Like, you have to, like, feel it. You know, you have to feel it to believe it. I salute you. Is that you? You die. You die, Monica. Not, I was going to say you die, Monica, because I'm in, like, philosophy mode, but thank you for the follow. You die, Monica. You die, Monica. <laughs> so, what was I saying? Yeah. So, there's things, it's like you have to feel it to believe it. And that's an old, uh, you know, there's hard headed ones of us. It's a good old quote from, who's that from? I forget. It's one of the rappers. You have to feel it to believe it. But, like, there are things that, like, that's the whole point. If you do not have the feeling it, you do not actually, like, believe it the right way. So. Once the Andalusian flamenco singer Pastora Pavon, La Nina de la, Los Peñas, 
La Sombre Spanish genius, equal in power or fancy to Goya or Rafael El Gallo, was singing in a little tavern in Cadiz. She played with her voice of shadows, with her voice of beaten tin, with her mossy voice. She tangled it in her hair or soaked it in manzanilla or abandoned it to dark distant briars. But there was nothing there. It was useless. The audience remained silent. In the room was Ignacio Espeleta, handsome as a Roman tortoise, who was once asked, Why don't you work? And who replied with the smile worthy of Argantonius, How should I work if I'm from Cadiz? Yeah, th <laughs> thanks for the follow, you, de you demonica. Uh, hope you're doing well. What I do here is I read and analyze things, usually academic philosophy, but other stuff if suggested. You know, th this reminds me. How should I work if I'm from Cadiz? It's like there are higher things to do. It reminds me of the old uh, bank robber. What would what he say? Why do you rob banks? He says, well, that's where the money is. I mean, that's sort of the thing. You do not have to do work. You can do other things that matter. And it's like, if you're from Cadiz, you know of something greater. It's like, I'm from a spot where there is something greater going on than a job. So... Why, why do you ride banks? Well, that's where the money is. Why should I work? I'm from Cadiz. I know something more. In the room was Elvira, fiery aristocrat, whore from Seville, descended in, in line from Soldad Vargos, who did in 30 didn't wish to marry with a Rothschild because she wasn't, in, wasn't her equal. He wasn't her equal in blood. In the room were the Floridas, whom people think are butchers, but who in reality are millennial priests who still sacrifice bulls to Guerrion. And in the corner was that formidable breeder of bulls, Don Pablo Morube, Morube with the look of a Cretan mask. Pastora Pavon finished her song in silence. Only a little man, one of those dancing midgets who left, leapt, who leap up suddenly from behind brandy bottles, sarcastically in a very soft voice said, Viva Paris! As if to say, here ability is not that important, nor technique, nor skill. What matters here is something else. Ah, so he's like saying, oh, the big city here. Live big city. The big city girl came to the town and thought that she was going to show us up. No one bought and no one bought it. Then La Nina de los Peñas got up like a mad woman, trembling like a medieval mourner, and drank, in one gulp, a huge glass of fiery spirits, and began to sing with a scorched throat, without voice, breath, color, but with duende. She managed to tear down the scaffolding of the song, but allow through a furious burning duende, friend to those winds heavy with sand, that make listeners tear at their tear at their clothes with the same rhythm as the negroes of the Antilles in their right, huddled before the statue of Santa Barbara. La Nina de los Penes had to tear apart her voice because she knew experts were listening, who demanded not form but the marrow of form, pure music with a body lean enough to float on air. She had to rob herself of skill and safety, that is to say, banish her muse and be helpless, so her duende might come, and deign to struggle with her at close quarters, and how she sang. Her voice no longer at play, her voice a jet of blood, worthy of her pain and her sincerity, open like a ten-finger hand, as in the feet, nailed there but storm-filled, of a Christ by Juan de Juni. Yeah, so you're doing, in some sense, it's a blood sacrifice, it sounds like here. You can do this, but it's going to cost you. So, you, it's like, it's something you know, you're, you have to, uh, you know, you have to pay the toll. So... Not everything works the way, like, you can just, you know, work at it and it's good. Some things you have to put your part of yourself in and risk part of yourself, you know. Nothing risked, nothing gained. And that counts for uh, a lot a lot of different things you can do. It works in music just as in other areas. The arrival of the Duende presupposes a radical change to all the old kinds of form, brings totally unknown and fresh sensations, with the qualities of a newly created rose, miraculous, generating an almost religious enthusiasm. This is the thing. So yeah, you're being reborn. You're sacrificing yourself to with the, with the possibility of some sort of a newly created thing. So the possibility of new creation here. But to do that, it has to come from, in some sense the a different kind of force you don't get that from uh you know a muse that's something you focus on but like you're not you're not changing yourself in that process 
In all Arab music, dance, song, or elegy, the arrival of Duende is greeted with vigorous cries of Allah, Allah, so close to the ole of the bullfight, and who knows whether they are not the same. And on all the songs of southern Spain, the appearance of the Duende is followed by sincere cries of Viva Dios, deep human, tender cries of communication with God through the five senses. Thanks to the Duende that shakes the voice and the body of the dancer, a real poetic escape from this world, as pure as that achieved by that rarest poet of the 17th century, Pedro Soto de Rojas, with his seven gardens, or John Climacus, with his trembling ladder of tears. Naturally, when this escape is perfected, everyone feels the effect. The initiate in seeing style defeat inadequate, the initiate in seeing style defeat inadequate content, and the novice in sensing authentic emotion. Years ago, an 80-year-old woman came first in a dance contest in Jerez de la Frontera against lovely women and girls with liquid waists merely by raising her arms, throwing back her head, and stamping with her foot on the floor. But in that crowd of muses and angels with lovely forms and smiles who could earn, their, earn the prize but her moribund duende sweeping the earth with its wings made of rusty knives. All the arts are capable of duende, but where it naturally creates most space, as in music, dance, and spoken poetry, the living flesh is needed to interpret them, since they have forms that are born and die perpetually and raise their contours above the precise present. Okay, so this is an interesting turn right here. So, it's saying it's a subjective thing, because you, you have to have a person there to do it, and that means you can't have some sort of written thing. It has to do with the times. And so anytime you like perform duende, you can't do it again the same way twice. You need to, in some sense, have to like re-experience in a new way. You can't duende two times. You can't like step into the duende twice. In the old Heraclitian quote, you can't step into the same river twice. It's not the same river and you're not the same person. Well, you can't do the same duende twice. You can't get the same motion in some sense. To do the same thing in the same emotion it can't be a ritual that just repeats itself. It has to be new. And so you can't really, it needs to be subjectively witnessed too, in some sense, because it's new and it's in a, like in between all the people it's seen by the others. So you can do it by yourself, but living flesh is needed to interpret them. It needs to be in the moment and it can't be written down on paper. If it's written down on paper, it's already missed its moment. So, Often the composer's duende fills the performers, and at other times when a poet or composer is no such thing, the performer's duende interestingly creates a new wonder that has the appearance of, but is not, primitive form. Yes, yeah, so of course, an actor can raise up some mediocre directing or something. That happens. This was the case with the duende haunted Eleonora Duze, who searched out failed plays to make triumphs of them through her inventiveness, and the case with Paganini, explained by Goethe, who made one hear profoundly mel me profound melody in vulgar trifles, and the case of a delightful young girl in Port St. Mary's, whom I saw singing and dancing that terrible Italian song, O Marie, with such rhythm, pauses, and intensity that she turned Italian dross into a brave serpent of gold. What happened was that each effectively found something new that no one had seen before that could give life and knowledge to bodies devoid of expression. Every art and every country is capable of duende, angel, and muse. And just as Germany owns, owns to the muse with a few exceptions, and Italy, the perennial angel, Spain is, at times, stirred by the duende, country of ancient music and dance, where the duende squeezes out those lemons at, of dawn, of country of death, a country open to death. In every other country, death is an ending, it appears, and they close the curtains, not in Spain. In Spain, they open them. Many Spaniards live indoors till the day they die and are carried into the sun. A dead man in Spain is more alive when dead than anywhere else on earth. His profile cuts like the edge of a barber's razor. Tales of death and the silent contemplation of it are familiar to Spaniards. From Quevedo's dream of skulls to Valdez, Leal's putrefying archbishop, and from Marabella in the 17th century, dying in childbirth in the middle of the road, who says... The blood of my womb covers the stallion. The stallion's hooves throw off sparks of black pitch. To the youth of Salta, Salamanca, recently killed by a bull who cried out, 
Friends, I am dying. Fri friends, I am done for. I have three scarves inside me, and this one makes four. Oh, definitely an ode to Spanish artists. I mean, this is interesting. It's basically... I think kind of what's happening here is he's out Nietzscheing Nietzsche. He's saying Nietzsche tried to do this and failed. I think that's why Nietzsche was pulled out earlier. But this is like a dead man in Spain is more alive when dead than anywhere else on earth. It's basically saying we already are made in the uh, face of the duende. And so our lives are already more um, when they're complete than anyone else's lives. So it's this is why you've already they've like complete they've already beaten Nietzsche to the punch, I think. Oh, it's, yeah, I mean, this is a love letter to Spain. Um, I think they even said so towards the beginning. They're saying our, our, basically saying our artists are better than your artists, and that's what matters. And, like, that would, like, Nietzsche would be like, no, we're the best. And he's like, no. Okay. And this one makes four. Stretches a rail of saltpeter flowers where a nation goes to contemplate death with on the side that's more bitter, the verses of Jeremiah, and on the moral lyrical side with fragrant cypress, but a country where what is most important of all finds its ultimate metallic value in death. Yeah, so they've culminated their life. The whole life is valued into their deaths. The hut, the wheel of a cart, the razor, and the prickly beards of shepherds, the barren moon, the flies, the damp cupboards, the rubble, the lace-covered saints, the wounding, the wounding lines of eaves and balconies. In Spain grow tiny weeds of death, illusions and voices, perceptible to an alert spirit that fill the memory with the stale air, air of our own passing. It's no accident that all Spanish art is rooted in our soil, full of thistles and sharp stones. It, it's no isolated example that lamentation of plebarios or the dances of the maestro Josef Maria de Valdivielso. It isn't chance that among all ballads of Europe, this Spanish one stands out. You Germans suck because you can't improvise. It's all about pre-thought mechanical repetition. Oh, yeah. No, well, they deserve that. So this what this ballad of Spanish stands out. If you're my pretty lover, why don't you gaze at me? The eyes I gazed at you with, I've given to the dark. If you're my pretty lover, why aren't you kissing me? The lips I kissed you with, I've given to the earth below. If you're my pretty lover, why aren't you hugging me? The arms I hugged you with are covered with worms, you see. Nor is it strange that the song is heard at the dawn of our lyrical tradition. In the garden I shall die. In the rose tree they will kill me. Mother, I went to gather roses, looking for death within the garden. Mother, I went cutting roses, looking for death within the rose tree. In the garden I shall die. In the rose tree they'll kill me. Yeah, again, this is getting back to earth in some sense. You never left, and when you get back, that's where you've really made it in the, uh, as a Spanish artist, which is morbid, but, you know, maybe they have a point. Those moon-frozen heads that Zubaran painted, the yellows of butter and lightning in El Greco. Oh, I love El Greco. Father Siguenza's prose, the whole of Goya's work, the apse of the Escorial Church, all polychrome sculpt sculpture, the crypt in the Duke of Osuna's house, the death with the guitar in the chapel of Bel Benavantes in Medina de Riosaco, equate culturally to the procession of St. Andres de Tuxedo, in which the dead take their places, to the dirges that the women of Asturias sing with their flame-bright torches in the November night, to the dancing chatting of the Sibyl in the cathedrals of Mallorca and Toledo, to the dark and record of Tortosa, and to the endless Good Friday rituals, which with the highly refined festivals of the bulls, form the popular triumph of death in Spain. In all the world, only Mexico can grasp my country's hand. <laughs> That's funny. I like that, though. Only the Mexicans, Mexicans know what's up. That's cool, though. You know, throw the Mexicans a bum. When the Musi's death appears, she closes the door or builds a plinth or displays an urn and writes an epitaph with her waxen hand, but afterwards she returns to tending her laurel in a silence that shivers between two breezes. Beneath the broken arch of the ode, she binds, in funeral funereal harmony, the precise flowers painted by 15th century Italians and calls up Lucretius' faithful cockerel, by whom unforeseen shadows are dispelled. When the angel sees death appear, he flies in so slow circles, and with tears of ice and narcissi weaves the elegy we see trembling in the hands of Keats, Villa Sandino, Herrera, Becker, and Juan Ramon Jimenez. 
but how it horrifies the angel if he feels a spider, however tiny, on his tender, rosy foot. <laughs> well, you know, when you write stuff, you can't, you can say this is for some people. That doesn't mean other people aren't going to get it. And you'd, you're an idiot if you think only certain people are getting it. The person has to know. But, you know, he's being over the top on this one. But, of course, there's people other places. Uh, what's her name? Lauren Hill got in trouble a while back because she said she doesn't sing for white people. She sings for black people. I mean, that's fine. I still love Lauren Hill to death. I don't care if she's not doing it for me. She can do it for whoever the hell she wants. I'm still listening to her work. So it's like... From Ecuador, you're criticizing Lorca's view on art and it turns into a nationalist view of art and passion. Yeah, I mean, it's hardcore nationalistic, but like the Spain that he's writing about here doesn't exist anymore. I don't know what year this is from, but it don't exist now. So it's like everyone can like you're even if you're Spanish, you can you can only look fondly in history for this. So it's like you can pretend like you're you're special if you're from Spain, but you have to go you have to in the modern world you have to you have to go wider you can't actually think it's only for uh you i mean and i'm not particularly fond of nationalism at the moment like it's not so great but it's this is the old like what are you going to do cancel culture the guy nah that's not the right move in this case you you, you find what's good in it okie doke the Duende, by contrast, won't appear if he can't see the possibility of death, if he doesn't know he can haunt, if he can haunt death's house, if he's not certain to shake those branches we all carry that do not bring, can never bring consolation. Yeah, see, this is the thing. You have to, you so you have to act with the possibility of death in that thing. Now, this could be like a Heideggerian. You have to understand your death and like orient your life impossible of it. But this is more. Um, Immediate. You have to see the possibility of death. How do you see the possibility of death? You have to be looking at death now. And that's part of the uh, thing. And haunt death's house. That's a fun phrase. If you can haunt death's house. Like that's an active thing you are doing. Like to be around death. So like this is in life that you would be haunting death's house. Yeah. With idea, sound, gesture, the duende delights in struggling freely with the creator on the edge of the pit. Yeah, at the edge of death. Angel and Muse flee with violin and compasses, and the duende wounds, and in trying to heal that wound that never heals lies the strangeness, the inventiveness of man's work. Again, yeah, nothing risked, nothing gained. First published 1933. Yeah, so this is after the First World War, trying to recover something. Yeah, and that Spain is very far gone. So it's like you're trying to recover something of meaning in the post world World War One sort of like flapper twenties and stuff, and the world's just like heading down to World War Two at this point. So it's like, yeah. The magic power of a poem cons consists in it always being filled with duende. In its baptizing all who gaze at it with dark water, since with duende it is easier to love, to understand, and to be certain of being loved, and being understood, and this struggle for expression and the communication of that expression in poetry sometimes acquires a fatal character. Remember the example of, la, of the flamenca duende filled St. Teresa. Flame, flamenca not for entangling an angry bull and passing it magnificently three times, which she did, not because she thought herself pretty before Brother Juan de la Miseria, nor for slapping his holiness, his holiness nuncio, but because she was one of those few creatures whose duende, not angel, for the angel never attacks anyone, pierced her with an arrow and wanted to kill her for having stolen his ultimate secret, the subtle link that joins the five senses to what is core to the living flesh, the living cloud, the living ocean of love liberated from time. Most valiant vanquisher of the Duende and the counterexample to Philip of Austria, who sought anxiously in theology for Muse and Angel and was imprisoned by a Duende of icy ardor in the Escorial Palace, where geometry borders on dream and where the Duende wears the mask of the Muse for the eternal punishment of that great king. We have said that the Duende loves the edge, the wound, the draw and draws close to places where forms fuse in a yearning bond in a yearning beyond visible expression. 
In Spain, as among Oriental races where the dance is religious expression, the duende has limitless hold over the bodies of the dancers of Cadiz, praised by Marshall, the breasts of those who sing, praised by Juvenal, and over all the liturgies of the bullring and authentic religious drama, where in the same manner as in the Mass, a god is sacrificed to and adored. Yeah, a lot of sacrifice here. It seems as if all the duende of the classical world is concentrated in this perfect festival, espounding the culture among and the great sensibility of a nation that revels the finest anger, bile, and tears of mankind. Neither in Spanish dance nor in the bullfight does anyone enjoy himself. The duende charges itself with creating suffering by means of a drama of living forms and clears the way for an escape from the reality that surrounds us. Okay, so this is kind of interesting here. No one's enjoying yourself when you're doing this. It's work. It's either work. It's either painful, but like you have to, you have to do something. It's not an enjoyment, because uh, you're not having fun. You're, you might, yeah, you're not having an an enjoyable time. There's something difficult about it. Um, it's creating suffering by means of a drama of living forms. So you have to get yourself into basically. You have to start some drama. Is what it is. So you're starting some drama between something alive. So you can have duende in your bullfight or, you know, in a dance between people. And what that does is it clears the way from escape from this reality. So you are creating a new way of uh, engaging, really. And so that's what you're doing. And that's the clearing from... It's not the reality that surrounds us in some sense. You're making space for new forms of uh, engagement with other living things. Um, there's good work on the philosophy of games actually now, but like philosophy of games, not like uh, we were talking, we were making fun of them, uh, game theory, like video games, um, that talks about this nowadays. So that is kind of what video games can do is it gives you a clear, it clears the way for an escape from reality by you engaging with the video game in some sense, the game designer providing a certain kind of drama, uh, drama between you and something that they do so i mean apropos being on twitch glenn glutendorf i'm watching youtube right now but what did it mean when it said no one enjoyed it i just said that okay so um can you hear me now <laughs> um so no one enjoys it means it's work and it's hard work basically when you're doing these dances you are getting you're making yourself um you're creating you're, you're, you're starting drama is what it is like no one enjoys yourself uh, I, I can't draw on this um yeah so w when you were like in one of these dances or in a bullfight you were creating a drama between living forms either between a person and a bull or between you and like your dancing public and uh, people you're dancing with so the idea is to how do you describe this? You're getting yourself emotionally charged up. You're getting yourself worked up. Getting yourself into a emotionally charged state is not really enjoyable. You might be enjoying a certain emotionally charged states, but not this one. This one is not like an enjo inherently enjoyable state. What you're doing is you're getting yourself emotionally worked up to get yourself in the possibility of even getting yourself injured or hurt or damaged. You're taking on the responsibility almost of getting yourself into a into drama with some other thing and once you are in drama with something outside of yourself you have the, the possibility of a getting hurt of suffering and doing so takes a lot of effort and anyone if you're doing it right it's more than like you can't be like enjoyment means you're sort of not overextending yourself and i think you are inherently overextending yourself in this account so, I hope you heard that one. <laughs> I, 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 there's no way I can write it down. Um, yeah, you can enjoy it. Yeah, and the no one here is a good question. Does anyone enjoy himself? It's the people doing it. You can like um, enjoy it. I think as like a, a spectator, but actually no, that's not fair. The spectator, to properly understand, does not enjoy it during the thing. Because if you are properly engaged with it, you are right there with the person. Or right there with the dancer. 
And so that would mean you are fully engaged with them and you are not really in that moment enjoying your, themse- yourself. Maybe afterward you could look back and be like, that was cool. But in that moment, you're crying. Like you can't do anything. You're just emotionally wrapped up. It's not an enjoyable thing to be bawling your eyes out. Looking back on it, you'd be like, wow, that was a great experience. But like if it's not like an enjoyable one to be like emotionally wrapped up like that. The Duende works on... Yeah, and ask more questions if you want. I'll try to expand, explain it the best I can. There's just my, you know, there's a reaction channel in some sense. I'm just reacting to it as I go. The Duende works on the dancer's body like wind on sand. It changes a girl by magic power into a lunar paralytic or covers the cheeks of a broken old man begging for alms in the wine shops with adolescent blushes, gives a woman's hair the odor of a midnight seaport, and at every instant works the arms with gestures that are the mothers of the dances of all the ages. This looks really interesting. I'm going to have to watch replay when I can. Sorry. So. Turn on. Sorry for interrupting. No, don't worry about it. It's just, this is a website. So, yeah. Sorry. It's a website, so I can't draw on it and make pictures. I like making pictures to explain things, and I can't do it right now. Because I only have it set up for the uh, PDFs. Yeah. All right. You can always like ask me later also on like next stream or whatever. And I can you can try to we can go back over this. But thanks to Infernal for suggesting it too. Infernal says, this leads me to another question. How does this connect with acting abilities? Cuz cuz you have to reproduce emotions to a level that is believable enough while conveying the intensity. But how does it connect with some people who don't have the capacity to feel like the normal people, like psychopaths who can mimic but not feel? Um, the question is, if you can mimic, that is sort of like the muse. You are copying something out in the world, but it's like the wrong thing. You don't have the feel is what's required. Now, you can mimic someone with Duende really accurately, but you're never going to be able to do it like on your own. So someone who is like a supreme actor can bring the, uh, you know, bring the goods 90% of the time, but it's not going to be, like, earth-shattering, I think. Like, so you're saying you could basically copy someone who does have that, but they can't make it up. Yes, but I'm going to say, look, if they can mimic really well, they can't feel it, but, like, basically they can make it look like they feel it. That just means they're super geniuses at copying. So that's fine, but they will never be more than, like, a great painting then. Like, no, a great photograph. Like, it's a photo- like they're a photograph of something that's worth seeing. But, you know, you see the photograph once, and it's great, but, like, it never changes. It's not really a work of art. It's like a copy of the... Uh, it's like a flat copy of the work of art. You can't actually get any more out of it than um, was there. If they were to keep copying the, uh, like, really good person that actually had the duende that would be amazing but like then they would be basically a like a like a magical mimic that was actually doing the thing um but that's like not possible um they can i would say is like what's the limit of like psychopaths like how how much of a psychopath like how good can they pass for someone who actually does it i think that's a good criticism of this account they're saying that like only what's up rethius how you doing Hope you're doing well. We're reading this uh, analysis of uh, aesthetics, actually. It's an aesthetics uh, thing based on the concept of duende in Spanish culture, su- suggested by Infernal. What I was going to say is basically, like in Harry Potter, like you have something that would like make you take on the, uh, the whole view. It is super subjective. They're trying to argue that they, this author is arguing nationalistically that they have something better than anyone else. Um, but you know, it's fine. Like they have, the person has something to say. They, they know how to write. So they're directing basically the, uh, source of inspiration into nature away from God, away from like muses and Anne Fernal saying, well, what if someone can just copy someone that can do this? 
um that would actually like it'd be a hard case for the author to uh come up with that someone who can fake the duende every single time but you know this is the thing that's the thing it's like there's no more depth to it it's just a it's a one uh they wouldn't be able to like adapt over time and what the author said earlier is that it has to be like adaptive because one adaptive in time for people at a certain place and a certain time you you can only do certain things and a mimic couldn't adapt with the times so i think that's what they would say you struggle with the subjective you feel like we can talk about subjectivity uh, at one point I, I i have a very hard time um, when people tell me that things are objective, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about when people say things are objective. Usually I understand subjective. I'm like, yeah, I think this tastes good. You don't think it tastes good. That's fine. But like the objective is like, nah, dude, you have no idea what's objective really. And Phil says the nationalistic aspect is said within a context that makes sort of sense, but that's pre-World War II Spain. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is definitely a piece of a time. Objectivity proves itself. Oh, so you're one of those, if it's true, it doesn't matter. It's just, it'll, it'll show up eventually. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not so sure, like, the truth comes out. I know a lot of people think that, like, you know, the way things are, you, you bend towards truth over time. I have no idea. And Phil says, subjectivity is not there as evidence of existence, just as an individual interpretation. I think truth is ideal. Yeah. Well, we can get into discussions of that. Yeah, we can. Which is obviously relative. Um, two plus two equals four. Objectively true. I know mathematicians that would disagree. I mean, I know what you mean, Rethius. I do. Like, I understand that two plus two is four. The problem is once you get out of math um and math is a relatively narrow part of our universe like it's great and all i know that but like i've never met a number like i've seen pictures of them yeah and mathematicians do disagree but like that's even if we have mathematical or logical truths that are absolutely true that is only one part of our world me Um, I, the, oh, I'm objectively alive at this moment. Sure. I'd go with that one. But again, like the number of things like that, uh, Rethius are few and far between and hosting it to extreme. That is true too. That's what I'm up to. Like, uh, okay. You don't. Eudemonica says truth doesn't really exist because everything is connected to before things and can't change the wave just trying to know what that is happening like will by Schopenhauer yeah so you you get this Hegelian sort of like things are just like flowing through time by Schopenhauer too so that's a different way of uh, inter that's like a different tradition here where you've got things that are just like flowing and so if you like are hitting things at one spot here it's kind of missing the point so yeah god is subjective because you need a personal relationship with god so uh yeah all right chat is moving a little fast here but okay so i understand the subjective because i understand my personal view is not what other people see a lot of times now i understand like green is green or whatever but because i'm looking like i'm looking out the window it's like there's a green tree but it gets very hard as soon as you get more complicated than that. Very, very hard. Like, you know, who's right in politics, who's right in soci sociology, all these things are... It Once you move away from the very simplistic uh, facts of the world, it gets very dif difficult. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think we are that far off. We never were. But... Th I think there's... When people talk about objective things, I think it's pretty limited in what you can actually talk about objective, and it's very rarely what they actually want to talk about. Like, the objective thing, like, you know, here's a hand. Yeah, that's objective, but, like, that's never what anyone says when they uh, are saying something's objective. On the metrics. 
how do we actually measure shit? Oh, Rethius, when you get down to like the, like what is measurement, it gets to be a really weird time. Like, uh, I don't have a ruler right here, but like the concept of like measurement is actually very strange. Um, it only, I think, happened last year, or maybe two years ago, where they finally got rid of the block of metal in France. Now, stop me if you know the story, but I'll tell it for the other people. The kilogram. Yeah. You got, you, you got it. You know what? You're telling us syntax may be different, but now to discussions about subject. Okay, so let me just tell you about the kilogram. Up until like two, three years ago, the kilogram was by definition a block of platinum iridium metal si sitting in a laboratory in Paris, France. So like that way. You don't have to get anything, you, you demonica. We're just discussing like, and you know, people are wrong, people are right, whatever. But like the, and that's cool, like and ask questions. And like I said, I'm reading this stuff for the first time, I'm just trying to interpret chat. But up until like two years ago, the block of uh, metal in Paris was the kilogram. Now, what happens, because the block of metal sublates, what that means is that like pieces will flake off just into the air. A piece of platinum, no, like platinum um, atoms will flake off and float into the air. It just turns into a gas. This happens. It's a piece of metal. It's a chemical reaction. It happens. What happens to the, the kilogram? when the size of the mass of the kilogram the official kilogram changes is every other other kilogram in the entire world now wrong now they had very complicated things to minimize this but in some sense every other kilogram in the entire world changes as not really being a kilogram when the kilogram in France changed And like that, like if you, in, if you look into like the history of this thing, it's, you know, it's hard. And that means every scientific, uh, measurement has to, um, yeah. And that's exactly what we're getting at. Like at Rethius, it's like, there's a platonic ideal of the kilogram, but in real life, it doesn't work out. Yeah. And it gets like, what does it mean to measure that thing at that point? Cause here's a question. If you measure the kilogram, what are you measuring it with? It is the kilogram. That is the thing that defines a kilogram. So what are you measuring it with? Anything else is just re relating back to that thing. And says measurement is a subjective matter that becomes objective due to people agreeing to something. Like what is the value of a thing? The gold spices Bitcoin. Absolutely. We agreed that that thing was the kilogram. And uh, like two years ago, we finally agreed that it was something else, which was a little bit more accurate, but it's still subjective in certain ways. Um, but yeah, like we have to, we all agreed that that's a kilogram, but the problem is how do you know how big a kilogram is then? Cause if you measure it, you're only measuring the thing with it, but like, how do you know when it changes weight then? Well, even think about plastic rulers it has to be a variance, however small in production of those things, but we all accept the measurement on the stick. That's absolutely right. And you know, for most of the uses that we have rulers for, that's fine. But like, you know, when you get to things that need more accurate measurement you have to use a different tool a plastic ruler does not work um but like that's a bit so it's a, a lot of times you have to have the tool for the job and is that thing really like the 12 inches or 30 centimeters that you thought it was eh kind of but we all accept that you know, we all and says we all agreed to that in the sense we just accept it and go along with it until a better tool comes in yeah that's right and so what does that mean um, in like the grand scheme of things? That's a huge discussion. And so at least bringing this back to the thing here is like, is there an objective thing of Duende that you can do? We need a soci <laughs> to the library, get a sociologist. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this is what subjectivity is here. Like, how do we agree? How do we do this? I know you're a sociologist. <laughs> yeah. So this is the thing. It's like, how do we coordinate these things, actually, is a good question. Coordination of agreement. And, uh, 
and this goes back to your your uh, your comment earlier. But in this next sentence in the, the, the paper here, but it's impossible for it ever to repeat itself. And it's important to underscore this. The duende never repeats itself any more than the waves of the sea do in a storm. And this is what gets to measurement. Measurement has to be repeatable. The duende never repeats itself. It is immeasurable. It's incommensurable. It is not possible to be measured in any way. This is what we were talking about before. And this is why when you said like you have a... um a mimic someone who's like a really good actor they can't they could mimic it once maybe and that would be okay but the second time they can't mimic it because the duende has already moved on so it's like it can't be measured it can't be mimicked because that's by definition it can't and so it's a it's un um copyable and it's unmeasurable <sighs> Uh, and the idea that philosophers are ever needed, you have one up on me. <laughs> its most impressive effect appear in the bullring since it must struggle on the one hand with death, which can destroy it, and on the other with geometry, measure, and the fundamental basis of the festival. Hey, I write trains for call center. I have to make myself needed. Well, we all have to. We all have to pay. Uh, we have to all have to make money in our capitalist society at the moment. And in other societies, but also capitalism. So it's like, yeah. So here's exactly geometry and measure right there. This is exactly the the discussion the discussion we are having. And on the one hand, with death, which can destroy it. So this the death is of course the end of the duende. Um. And then with the measurement, the repeatability on the other one. Yeah. So yeah, like Rethius like makes interesting like scenarios for people. It's kind of cool. The bull has its own orbit, the, tor the toreador his, and between the orbit and the orbit lies the point of danger where the vertex of terrible play exists. See, yeah, this is the terrible play, like what we were saying earlier. There's a game and interaction between things where it's great and terrible all at once. You can, o you can own to the muse with, th with the muleta, and to the angel with banderias and pass for a good bullfighter, but in the work with the cape, while the bull is still free of wounds, and at the moment of the kill, the aid of the duende is required to drive home the nail of artistic truth. Hey, we got to truth. So this is the thing. In that moment, you are doing something bigger. In the kill. Yeah. Well, the bull should win sometimes. The bullfighter who terrifies the public with his bravery in the ring is not fighting bulls, but has lowered himself to a ridiculous level to doing what anyone can do by playing with his life. But the Toreador who is bitten by the Duende gives a lesson in Pythagorean music and makes us forget that his is constantly throwing his heart at the horns. Lajartijo with his Roman Duende, Joselito with his Jewish Duende, Belmonte with his Baroque Duende, and Cojancho with his, gyps his Gypsy Duende showed from the twilight of the bullring, poets, painters, and composers, the four great highways of Spanish tradition. So this is nice. You're hitting around, at least even if there's a Spanish tradition, you're hitting the uh, some of the subgroups here. Romans, you got the Jews, you got, the like a, I don't know, Baroque, um, and Gypsies. So this is not... Yeah, well, if you're going to be in Spain, you have to call on something very, very Spanish to uh, talk about Spanish art. And what else you got? Hey, Spain is unique. Spain is unique, a country where death is a national spectacle, where dead death sounds great bugle where death sounds, great bugle blasts on the arrival of spring, and its art is always ruled by a shrewd duende, which creates its different and inventive quality. The duende who, for the next first time in sculpture, stains with the blood, cheek, the blood the cheeks of the saints of that master, Matteo de Compostela, is the same one who made St. John of the Cross groan or burns naked nymphs in Lope's religious sonnets. Rethia says, but every country is unique. Next bullet. Um, yeah, see, that's the thing. Everyone is preferential to like their little corner of the world. And, like, it's very hard to get out of that. Like, you know, everyone has a soft spot for, like, their hometown. Or, like, their home culture, I guess you could say. Yeah. 
I, I've heard bullfighting has been banned, but I heard it's not banned everywhere. It's been banned in places that didn't traditionally have it. I was talking to someone that was uh, working in Spain, and they said it's banned in certain areas, but those were the areas that never really had bullfighting anyway. The duende that raises the towers of Sahagun or bakes hot bricks in Calatayud or Teruel is the same as he who tears apart El Greco's clouds and kicks out Quevedo's bailiffs and Goya's chimeras and drives them away. When he reigns, he brings Duende, haunted Velasquez, secretly from behind his monarchic graves. When he snows, he makes Herrera appear naked to show that the cold does not kill. When he burns, he pushes Berruguete into the flames and makes him invent new dimensions for sculpture. Gongor's muse and Garcilaso's angel must loose their laurel wreaths when St. John of the Cross's Duende passes by when the wounded stag appears over the hill. Gonzalo de Bar Barceo's muse and the archpriest of Gita's angel must depart to give way to Jorge Manrique, wounded to death at the door of the castle of Belmonte. Gregorio Hernandez's muse and Jose de Mora's angel must bow to the passage of de, Muenas, de Menas, duende weeping tears of blood, and Martinez Montaña's duende with the head of an Assyrian bull, just as the melancholic muse of Catalonia and the damp angel of Galicia gaze in loving wonder at the duende of Castile, so far from their warm bread and gentle grazing cattle with its norms of sweeping sky and dry sierra. You were one-fifth impressed with that poem about the wounded stag. Well, cool. One-fifth is better than zero. Quevedo's Duende and Cervantes, the one with the green anemones of phosphorus, the other with flowers of Ruidera gypsum, crown the altarpiece of Spain's Duende. Each art, as is natural, has a distinct mode and form of Duende, but their roots unite at the point from which flow the dark sounds of Manuel Torre, the ultimate matter, the uncontrollable mutual depth and extremity of wood, sound, canvas, word. Dark sounds behind which, in tender intimacy, ex exist volcanoes, ants, zephyrs, and the vast night pressing its waste against the Milky Way. Yeah, so we're finally getting back to just, like, the naturalistic uh, stuff here. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have raised three arches with clumsy hands placed within them with the muse, the angel, and then and the duende. The muse remains motionless. She can have a finely pleated tunic or cow eyes like those which gaze out in Pompeii at the four-sided nose her great friend Picasso has painted her with. The angel can disturb Antonella de Messina's head of hair, Lippi's tunics, or the violins of Messino or Rousseau. We, we see, yes, in fact, Nogar, how have we gotten this far without you two being a duende? I... I don't know. I'm trying to get to the end of it. I don't know when this is. Up oh, there's the end. I didn't know where the end was. I was like, I just got to keep going at this point. I'm going for over an hour on this uh, paper. I, I was like, I don't know where the end is. So I was kind of afraid of stopping and doing something in the middle. I got some something to say right here on this uh, three the tripartite angels thing. Let's uh, get the last paragraph in. The Duende. Where is... The the duende through the empty archway a wind of the spirit enters blowing insistently over the heads of the dead in search of a, of new landscapes and unknown accents a wind with the odor of a child's saliva crushed glass and medusa's veil announcing the endless baptism of freshly created things <sighs> well that was exciting that was fun i like these sorts of things i mean the philosophy i read is way less well written it's often less interesting and this at least has good philosophical content i mean right here shit youtube thinks duendes are like horror yeah because it's, it's the death uh uh focus here is definitely i could see people picking up on that okay so we've got the muse the angel and the duende Basically, what we've got here, I think, is an alternative to Nietzsche's Apollinean and Dionysian. Um, so, yeah, I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, oh, yeah, do I have sound hooked up? I don't think I ever hooked up the damn sound. I got to try to make sure I get sound working on the uh, video here. But anyway, the muse, the angel, and the duende. So we've got Dionysus in the muse. This is the, you know, the party girl. Is like some like this is the Dionysian um, getting drunk at the party. The angel is the Apollinian. 
this is the you know the godly structures and then the duende is this thing you've got a nature that is different that is something else that is this uh tearing at the uh at the seams between the two of them and that's where the artist here is living um is in between is getting pulled between getting rid of the muse getting rid of the angel so we're not doing the dionysian thing where you're just getting drunk and partying with girls and you're getting fascinated by that you're not doing the religious thing where you've got these great structures and you want to like make some grand uh, scheme a wonderful metaphysics the duende exists in a time and place where you're getting pulled by the people that are there in that one spot and does not exist Dionysus is my I mean, him and Diogenes. Yeah, I mean, Diogenes is, is my dude, too. Um, so, yeah. And we're all friends here. I was thinking about this a lot. You know, like, I can't even claim that this is a safe space for, like, you know, the various peoples on Twitch. Because I can't guarantee what I'm reading is not, like, completely jackass worthy. But, like, I'm, I can guarantee you I will, ho I will be hostile to bad things. <laughs> so it's like, I'm not a safe space. I'm, I, I have a hostile space, but I, I'm hostile at like bad people. So it's like a, a very useful hostile space. So it's like, don't feel bad if like stuff happens here. It's cool. And it's all good. All right. So let's see this link. See if I can pull this up. Copy link. Let me, I still have the music going. Let's pause that. See what we got. Now, Can I take it you can't hear anything. Let me see. Yeah, it's not, it's not coming up. Let me see if I can, uh. Yeah, I, I know it's not it's not showing up on the uh, mixer. So give me half a second. I'm trying to remember where it is. All right, let me see. Okay, if if it's not worth it, then. I'll have to. I'm, I forgot to. I forgot to fix it last time. I apologize. I should have uh, fixed. Because you know, I, I would be like to be able to show YouTube videos. But yeah, yeah. Like, what is this? Jump scares. Yeah, this is um a little odd. I don't know what that is. Oh, the image of the duendes in urban myth. Yeah, I, I don't know if you were here, Aretheus. Yeah. Anne was telling us that it's literally a translation of the word leprechaun, even though it doesn't seem to be used as a leprechaun here. Um, so you're talking about like jump scary leprechaun-y things. Oh, it's a true crime mini podcast. Not worth the time though. Okay, that's fine. All right, so let's just, do we have anything else you guys want to ask me about this? Because I think this is interesting that there's a third, this is basically, as far as I can understand it, the muse, it's not exactly Dionysus. This is a slightly different concept going on here where you've got some sort of like falling into a theory of like a, a lover or some like, like you could have like your, like a drug could be your muse. And so that's why I brought up Dionysus. But like you could have like a lover or some sort of uh, drug, something that you focus on that's external, but it's singular. You have red hair. Are you a uh, duende? Oh, wow. We have one in chat. That's amazing. Again, the angel is the straight up Nietzschean Apollinian. It's the great structure. You're trying to like raise yourself up by building systems. And then you have the duende. It's those, yeah, this is the um, essence of true art, which is neither going after some singular thing like a person or raising yourself up in some big theory. It's this um, naturalistic thing within your blood of like the breaking of what you are in an emotional drama, not even emotional. You're getting your, you're creating a drama with your whole self and death for that matter like it's part of your entire being and that's where great art comes from that je ne sais quoi that makes art a sensitive human expression yeah so it's in the time at the place where you have sort of fully engaged with yourself in a risky way to be honest 
because you are fully engaged. You don't have any sort of reserves. And uh, that's where the great art is. And that was what they were saying right here. It's like if you're just talking about some idiot bullfighter making it scary because he's uh, ma like making you afraid for his life and death. Um, that's terrible art. He's saying basically it. what you need to do is have a relationship with the bull. And at the moment that not the fear of your death, but the, the way you actually handle with the bull, then you have the right kind of drama between living beings and the audience. And as uh, was said earlier, there it's not an enjoyable thing in the time of it. It is enjoyable kind of like, what's the old word? Um, uh, dag nab it, where it's you, it's an emotional release where the art is actually giving you a, um, it's with an A, I can't freaking remember. But it's, a, it's from the Greek tragedy. It's giving you the emotional release that, in some sense, you like it after the fact. During the like tragedy, you don't like the tragedy. It's horrifying. But after the fact, you have basically, then you can enjoy it because you, uh, in some sense, have like been purified. It has rinsed you of all the drama. Like the drama was there. It's over with, and you have some sense been rinsed of it by you know experiencing it in the time and place so that's what happens i start losing thoughts and words over time okay cathartic yeah that thank you infernal <laughs> yeah so this is a great catharsis and i think that's what because there were questions about what is what why are you not enjoying it because it's cathartic that's the kind of art we're making here with duende it's a cathartic art um and it's interesting to have an uh, uh, like an opposing view on cathartic art that doesn't have to be just the greek tragedy style it can be a dance uh, a catharsis here and bullfighting is catharsis so <sighs> so where is it it's a search for the unknown you know a wind with the odor of a child's saliva. I have no idea what child's saliva smells like. It's crushed glass. And they were saying crushed glass in your blood before. So that's like scary. And Medusa's veil. Like just the, the slightest breeze would not get, could like move it and you turn yourself into stone. So it's interesting. It's all these endless baptism of freshly created things. Yeah. So cool. That was fun. If anyone has any last comments, let me know or else we'll, Go look at something else for...